welcome back to another reaction and ting and ting and ting. I'm Mr. Giant and we're back on the crusade kick, man. This one is called Sack of Constantinople 1204, Fourth Crusade Documentary. Yeah, yeah, this is where action start heating up and ting, you know what I mean? So I ain't gonna keep you all here too long. Let's go ahead and YouTube and Sim Simmer and see what's going on here. The Crusades are some of the most iconic and divisive wars fought in human history, and the image of knights in shining armor had a lasting effect on generations of history enthusiasts. Yet, even among them, the Fourth Crusade is universally regarded as a failure, an example of the extent of human greed and the tragedy of loss. In this video, we will tell the story of this doomed venture and the repercussions that followed in its wake. This video is sponsored by ExpressVPN. We use ExpressVPN as it provides a quick and simple way to make your internet activity private. Take back your internet privacy today and find out how you can get three months free. Go to expressvpn.com slash kings and generals. In 1187, Jerusalem was conquered by Saladin. As a response, the Christian world initiated the Third Crusade, and although the Crusaders managed to retake Acre and Jaffa, Jerusalem remained a part of the Ayyubid realm, and the conflict ended in a truce. Resolve to retake Jerusalem was still strong. By 1198, Pope Innocent III had begun a call for a Fourth Crusade. An army, consisting mainly of soldiers from France and the Holy Roman Empire, was mustered through the charisma of the Italian Count Boniface of Montferrat. However, this army would still need ships to carry them across the Mediterranean, and thus the Crusaders turned to the strongest maritime power of the era, the Republic of Venice. The Doge, Enrico Dandolo, agreed to manufacture a fleet capable of transporting the Crusader army for the price of 85,000 silver marks. See, money, money involved. The plan was now as follows. The Crusaders would sail south from Venice and attack the center of the Muslim world, Egypt. After conquering the Ayyubid capital, they would then proceed to take Jerusalem by land. However, problems began when the Crusader army arrived in Venice in May of 1202. Out of an expected 33,500 soldiers, only 12,000 were present. This infuriated the Venetians, as they had incurred a great expense building a total of 50 war galleys and 450 transport ships for the Crusaders, who were now incapable of paying their debt. Dandolo refused to allow the Crusaders to leave his city before the debt was paid. The Crusaders managed to collect up to 50,000 marks, but by doing this, they now risk starving. Not wanting their investment to have been a complete loss, the Doge Dandolo hatched a plan in order to use the Crusaders to serve the Venetian agenda. He proclaimed the debts would be wiped if they were to take the city of Zara in the name of Venice. Zara, located on the eastern Adriatic coast, was a Catholic city ruled by the Catholic King of Hungary. For an army endorsed by the Pope in Rome, attacking it was a problematic prospect. Knowing this, some of the Crusaders refused the Venetian's deal and headed home but most of the army set sail across the Adriatic to fulfill the Doge's request. When Pope Innocent III heard of this deal, he immediately threatened the Crusaders with excommunication. Count Boniface hid this letter from the army and pushed on to Zara. When they reached the walls of the city, the peoples of Zara hung banners of crosses along the outer walls, professing their Catholic faith. Despite this, the Crusaders sieged, breached, and sacked the city, killing many. Furious at the disobeying of his orders, the Pope excommunicated all the Venetians and Crusaders involved in the sack. But the Crusade leaders once more hid this letter from the army, 
fearing it would cause panic and desertion. Oh yeah. The Crusaders take them with his beard in Zara and plan their next move come the spring. Meanwhile, Bonifacio of Montferrat had left the army and sailed to southern Bavaria to visit his cousin, King Philip of Swabia. Here he met an exiled prince of the Byzantine Empire, Alexius IV Angelos. It is here that we must take a brief pause and contextualize the situation in the Byzantine Empire. The Comnenian dynasty, which ruled between 1081 and 1180, managed to retake most of Anatolia from the Seljuks, but with the death of Manuel Komnenos in 1180, things had changed, and the new dynasty, the Angeloi, was weak and despotic. In 1185, Isaac II became the emperor, but he was highly corrupt, and in 1195, he had been blinded and usurped by his brother, Alexius III. Emperor Alexius fared no better than his predecessor, and revealed himself to be just as corrupt. Meanwhile, the son of the deposed Emperor Isaac, Alexius IV, had fled to Swabia to avoid the wrath of his uncle. It is here our story rejoins the Fourth Crusade. The young prince saw an opportunity to use the Crusader army for his own means. He implored Bonifacio to lead the Crusaders to Constantinople and depose his uncle, Emperor Alexius III. In exchange, he offered to pay 200,000 silver marks, offered 10,000 Byzantine soldiers for the campaign into Egypt, and most importantly, swore that the Eastern Orthodox Church would be placed under the authority of the Pope in Rome. Ambitious little fellow. Many crusaders were hesitant to accept, not wanting to attack yet another Christian city. The Venetians, never ones to turn down an opportunity to get rich, were fierce supporters of this plan. Doge Dandolo offered the crusade leaders heavy bribes to convince them to sail to Constantinople. Thus, the Latin army and the young pretender prince set sail for the capital of Eastern Christendom. On June 23, 1203, the Latin army came within sight of Constantinople. The Byzantines were aware of the impending arrival of the Crusaders. The city was defended by 15,000 soldiers, 5,000 of whom were Varangians, an elite imperial guard made up of Saxons and Norsemen. It did not take long for fighting to begin. The massive Crusader fleet crossed the Dardanelles Strait and laid siege to the suburbs outside of Constantinople proper. The Latin cavalrymen used the cleverly constructed Venetian horse transport ships, which carried the knights right onto the beach, allowing them to charge directly out onto the shore to meet their foes. The Crusaders were repulsed in brief skirmishes at Chalcedon and Chrysopolis, but won a beachfront entanglement outnumbered 80 to 500. Nothing conclusive was determined. The Latins now realized that in order to gain a foothold in the city, they would need to take Constantinople's famous harbor, the Golden Horn, which was protected by a massive chain that prevented any ships from entering. Thus the Crusader fleet sailed up the Bosphorus Strait. Emperor Alexius III had anticipated this and mustered a sizable defending force that waited on the shore north of the suburb of Galata. The Crusaders charged right out of their horse transports and barreled down upon the Byzantine defenders in a full cavalry charge. The Greeks scattered, retreating to the Tower of Galata, where they fortified themselves. Back and forth fighting continued for a while, with the Crusaders barraging the tower and being repulsed. Eventually they breached the walls and chased out the Byzantines. By taking the tower, the Crusaders were able to lift the chain and allow their fleet to sail into Constantinople's harbour mouth. From their new foothold, they boarded the young royal upon a Venetian barge and sailed up to the city walls, shouting out their good intentions, declaring themselves as restorers of the rightful Byzantine ruler. 
Instead, the sight of young Alexius IV brought out jeers from the local population, who hurled insults, rocks, and rotten fruit at the young pretender. This was a revelation, as Alexius IV had claimed that he still had substantial support. But the crusaders were in too deep now to simply pack up and go home. The prelates within the Latin army insisted that they remained within their right in supporting their patron prince. The siege resumed in the coming days in the form of a two-pronged assault. The Venetian detachment sailed their ships down the city's seawall and launched an assault, while the crusaders, led by Count Boniface, assaulted the land wall northwest of the city. Here the Varangians proved their worth. The Nordic warriors met the crusaders outside the land wall and inflicted heavy casualties. With the land front handled, they made for the sea. By this point, Venetian soldiers had secured a section. There's so much going on, you know what I mean? And it seems like the battlefields were like wider back then, I guess because it's like manpower more than anything else in there. Everything took manpower, you know? There's no sitting there in a computer going ding, ding, boom, you know? But uh, all of this is going on and you know, one man is in charge of all of this, even though he's got generals and lieutenants and stuff all over the place. Though they would have to make decisions too that would, you know, make or break a battle or something like that, you know, just one little mistake and it's, the whole thing crumbles. It's like organized chaos. That's got to be confusing, unless you were trained, I guess, in that, that kind of a warfare because, you know, it is organized chaos and each side knows what the other side is doing by battle formations. Huh. They learn about each other. Huh, that's you know. This is what they would do there, this is what this tribe would do here, this is their signature move. No thy enemy, I guess, back then. Let's keep going here. Action of the sea wall encompassing twenty five towers. After fierce fighting, the Varangians routed the Venetians, who were forced back to their ships. The Venetians covered their retreat by lighting a wall of fire, which spread and devastated a large chunk of the city. It was at this point that the Byzantine Emperor finally sprung into full action. He rallied a host of 8,500 men, and rode with them out of the gates of St. Romanus to finally beat the Crusader host head on. Yet, this would end in anti-climax. Fear overcame the despotic Alexius III, and in his cowardice, he launched a full retreat back into the city walls before there had even been a fight. This remarkably shameful display disgraced the Emperor in the eyes of his people, and he quietly fled from the city, abandoning his post. The imperial court quickly deposed Alexius III and reinstalled the frail and blind Isaac II Angelos as emperor. This move alarmed the Latins, who could only hope to collect the payment offered to them under Alexius IV. As such, they demanded that the young prince be elevated to co-emperor alongside his decrepit father. The Byzantines, wary of any further damage to their city, accepted. Thus, the first siege of Constantinople was successful, and the Crusaders and Venetians accomplished their goal in restoring Alexius IV to the Roman throne. An uneasy status quo had developed between the people of Constantinople and the Crusaders. The Latins demanded that the young new emperor pay what was promised to them. 200,000 silver marks was a massive debt, and the fact that Alexius III had stolen a good chunk of the royal treasury when he fled the city did not help. As a result, the crown was forced to collect precious Byzantine and Roman icons, many centuries old, and melt them down to produce enough silver. This blemished the reputation of the new emperor in the eyes of his people, and paid only half of the debt. Things quickly deteriorated, 
and the Greeks of the city became more and more resentful, not only towards the Crusaders, but all Latin peoples, including the minority that had lived in Constantinople for generations. A riot broke out, and the Greek populace looted and burned the homes of Italian residents, killing many civilians. In a retaliatory fervor, the Venetians rallied a rabble of soldiers and stormed through the walls, attacking a mosque in one of the city's Muslim communities, but were fought off by the Muslims and Greeks standing side by side. Once again, the Venetians set a fire to cover their retreat, burning yet another chunk of the city and leaving many homeless. It was becoming clear that Alexius IV would likely never pay the rest of his debt. When the Crusaders issued an ultimatum, the young emperor refused. At this point, Daniel cried out, Miserable youth, we dragged you out of the mire, and to the mire we shall return you. During this period, a Byzantine courtier of the Ducas family, known as Mort Zuflos, had been the main advocate for resistance against the Latins, and his popularity increased. In February of 1204, this shrewd politician declared that the Byzantine people were tired of the rule of the Latin sympathizer Alexius IV. The emperor was strangled to death, and Mordzuflos was publicly declared the new Roman emperor as Alexius V. This change in leadership prompted the Crusaders to call for a meeting under a banner of peace. The Latin demands were heavy. They expected Mordzuflos to pay them 5,000 pounds of gold for their departure, swear his fealty to Pope Innocent III, and restore Alexius IV to the throne. The Latins were unaware he was dead. Before the Byzantines could reply, a Frankish cavalry charge thundered down the docks, scattering the emperor and his guard. Some crusaders trusted no deal made with the Greeks, and it was now abundantly clear that hostilities would continue. By the end of February, the crusaders had fully resolved to complete a full conquest of Constantinople. The prelates of the crusade declared that the Greeks were heathens and traitors to Christ. It seemed Mord Zuflos knew a full invasion was soon to come. He urgently tried to sway the Varangian guard to his side. The Nordic mercenaries demanded more pay that the new emperor could not provide, and thus they abandoned the fight. Constantinople was left with almost no garrison. On April 12th, the attack began. Favorable winds carried the bulk of the Venetian fleet right up towards the Theodosian seawall. Once more from their ships, the Latins managed to seize a section of the fortifications in the northwest part of the city. They commandeered the Blackenai Palace and used it as a base from which they would strike out at the rest of the city. In order to defend their position, the Crusaders lit a wall of fire around the Blackenai district. This fire spread, destroying yet another chunk of the city. It's just burning everything. Mort Zuflos tried to rally more defenders, but the people of Constantinople were now in a panic and in no shape to resist. Mort Zuflos fled the city, and Constantinople was left defenseless. And thus, the sack of Constantinople began. The Crusaders began a spree of looting, raping, and massacring that was near unprecedented. Hundreds of thousands would die, and countless priceless treasures were destroyed or stolen. Reactions in Western Europe to the sack were mixed. Many expressed shock and horror at the Crusaders' actions, including Pope Innocent III, yet many defended the sack, claiming that the Greeks were traitors to Christ. Following the sack of Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire was partitioned among Western Latin powers and the rump Byzantine states. The largest was the Latin Empire, with Constantinople as its capital. 
Baldwin I, Count of Flanders, and the most charismatic of the Crusaders, was chosen to rule as the Latin Emperor. The fracturing of the Byzantine Empire greatly weakened Christendom's hold on Asia Minor and the Aegean Sea. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and I'm telling you, man, that, that's just crazy there. Can you imagine being surrounded by the enemy, knowing they're coming and for days and days is going on and they're just out there waiting and you know you can't win because people are retreating and you're going to have to be submissive to someone else. It's inevitable. It's coming. You know it's coming. I mean, back home it was like, oh, they're here. Oh, it's blowing, it's blowing up. Oh, okay, that's going on. I mean, that's, um, that's being kind of... mild about the situation but uh imagine though you know it's just you know they're out there and you can see them you know and they're probably singing and, and carrying on you know so they can they, they, you know that they're coming wow the things we put each other to and, and you see how nicely they use the religious side of it the greeks they turned against jesus and god and stuff like that you know so you know all the people who just have faith, well, yeah, you know, that's what it is, you know, using that religion. But anyway, man, thank you all for watching this with me. Hope you guys are having great days, nights, whatever time it is where you are. Remember to take care of yourself. Make life cool runnings, all right?